we have a project funded by JEF and UNEP, uh, where Biodiversity International, in collaboration with NARC, Labor, and Department of Agriculture, is implementing project on uh, Himalayan crops, conservation and sustainable use of agrobiodiversity of the Himalayan regions. So based on th that work I'm presenting here, uh, well, uh, my, so uh, all of us know that, well, current food systems are not able to deliver diverse nutritious food for the changing, increasing populations. But uh, my, here, uh, assumption and my emphasis would be here is that if you focus on indigenous traditional food crops based on biodiversity, using locally available biodiversity of the existing farming system, we can address uh, some of the challenges of you know, food and nutrition system and also to solve the, uh, and improve the resiliency of the farming and food system. Uh, well, the presentation, so I'll go briefly on uh, what is this traditional indigenous crop and what is the value chain, the metallurgical framework, and the analysis of the value chains, and our experience of you know, how we could improve upgrading the existing value chain so that we can solve uh, the nutritional needs of both urban and rural populations, both for producers themselves, farmers themselves, as a consumer of the households, to meet their increasing diverse nutritional needs, fresh, healthy, organic foods, as well as the growing urban population for young generations living in Kathmandu. So this work is based in mostly in the very remote area of mountain regions, uh, particularly in Humla, Karnali province, two of the districts, Humla, Jumla, and also Dolakha, and the Lamjung, particularly focusing in the high mountain Gurung village. So as many of you already know, these are uh, many of our indigenous traditional food. And these food crops, I have, these are major food stables in the Himalayan region in the Nepal. So ranging from, you know, amaranth, buckwheat, barley, uh, beans, we have a mixed color beans from Jumla, Humla, Mustang, so on. And also porso millet, we, we say chino, uh, foxtail millet, kaguno, finger millet, and also the high altitude so-called marshy rice, we are, pop, we know it, red rice, jumli rice. These are grown in the highest altitude in the world, in Nepal. You know, many of you know that rice is grown in the highest altitude in Nepal, in Jumla, around 3,000 meters up to, but finger millet itself is also grown in the highest altitude in the, uh, in uh, Simikot, near Simikot in Humla, near, near around 3,100 feet. So uh, these crops are very important for food, security, food and nutrition security of the mountain people in the Himalayan regions. So if you see the data, so almost 30 to 75 percent of the area in the Himalayan mountain regions covers by these crops. If you cover total, but particularly in some of the districts, like if you see in the Karnali, Mugu, Jumla, and Humla, almost 60 to 74 percent of the area is covered by these crops. In Humla district, finger millet is the number one crop. Okay, so uh, buckwheat is number one in Mustang and Manang, and in second in Dolpa. So. But our current research, education, and investment policy have not focused on these crops, despite they have a very high nutrient dense, nutrient value, grown in default in organic conditions, fresh with Himalayan water, I, I, on, uh, uh, I mean to say marginal conditions, fresh organic conditions, and also they are very indigenous to local uh, farming systems, and resilient to, you know, changing climate, very grown in the very harsh, marginal, mountainous regions, grown up to 4,500 meter altitude in f f when this, I mean, half of the six months are covered by snow, still few months, you can grow like buckwheat, you can grow in three months, in, the, in lowland we can grow two months, it's a very short duration, can meet the food needs of the, in the marginal people during lean seasons. <coughs> uh, and also, Many of them are gluten-free, micronutrient rich, rich in dietary fibers, and we call it now, many are now FU also calls it future smart food. Now we have, uh, since last five years, we have uh, uh, defined them as a Himalayan superfood. So because they are rich in nutrient, 
So if you see the, uh, this is a data from Department of Food Technology Quality, DFTQC. If you see the, these crops are very rich in some of the micronutrients like iron, calcium. Finger millet has almost 10 times higher calcium than many of our rice and other crops. Okay, they are rich in phosphorus and iron and so on. So I don't need to say more on this. So the objective uh, here is why we want to focus on value chain uh, of these traditional crops. Uh, you know, for these crops are very important. I mentioned the nutrition uh, rich crops and also because they are also resilient to changing climate, locally available, easily accessible, indigenous, affordable, and very important food crops for the high mountain regions. And, and no research and in education and investment extension systems have not focused much on this. Uh, and also, they have a potential of, uh, of, uh, options. They have a potential option to improve value chain because many of so, uh, diverse nutritious foods are not available easily in market in Kathmandu or in urban areas. So uh, I would like to focus here how uh, this traditional crop, um, how focusing on biodiversity-based value chain of this traditional crop could improve nutrition sensitive agriculture. How could improve nutrition? Uh, and healthy diets of the growing population. So if you have a diversity in the production system, if agriculture system is diverse, you know, growing diverse species, diverse cultivars, with diverse seed systems, then you can have a diversity in the market, available diversity. Unless we have a availability in the production system, we cannot uh, expect diversity in the market. And we need to also have a diversity in the market so that we can have diversity in the diets, in the table. But for that also, we need to have a diversity in the processing because many of these crops cannot be processed easily in the diverse form. They are processed only very small, few options they have. No di diversity of options for processing to different sort of uh, uh, noodles or biscuits or multigrains and so on. I mean, they are cooked either uh, uh, dido or I mean, traditionally like porridge or pancake, and also uh, uh, socially these crops are not eaten, and there is a social, high social stigma, culturally not much acceptable because of the increase of the modern food culture. So the objective of the study is to explore value chain for this, and also assess the potential role of these crops in the nutrition sensitive agriculture. Well, the methodology is uh, combined, uh, I used to, uh, I combined the both value chain methodologies based on a conceptual framework of biodiversity based value chain. We have a commercial monocrop homogeneous city driven value chain. Many, we have a lot of literature available, but value chain based on biodiversity is not available. So here the focus is how we can uh, uh, consistently uh, and uh, determine the value chain based on biodiversity so that we have a diversity in the nutrition food system in the uh, consumption system. That is the way. So uh, also uh, this was combined by surveys and mix of quality to quantitative studies supplemented by various uh, workshop in, uh, interaction meetings with these key stakeholders at the local and national level. Well, these are the uh, summary sites. Uh, Jumla, Humla, and Lamjung, Dolakha, Lamjung, in, we have uh, in Ghana Pokhara in the higher altitude. Dolakha near the Gauri Sankar uh, village municipality near the border of almost north side of the districts. Uh, so if you see the, uh, the existing baseline scenario, the diversity of these crops are very high in many of the sites, particularly in Karnali like Jumla and Humla. Almost all crops are grown by large number of households. Millet is grown everywhere, finger millet, but porso millet like chino and kagono, foxtail millets are specific to more into Karnali, Zumla and Humla. Uh, and, but other uh, crops are grown everywhere. Uh, if you see now in the national statistics, the last 30 years, based on uh, census, you know, CBS data, so if, uh, when I try to analyze, if since 1991 to 2011, we have available census. And agriculture census data from CBS. So area under finger millet is drastically declined. Almost 100,000 hectares has, the originally we have in during 1991, we have 300,000 hectares, but now declined to 200. So almost 100 hectares have area is declined in finger millet. Well, all for barley and buckwheat, they were grown in small area, but declining is smaller, but it's, uh, uh, 
also declining fast. We don't have statistics for other data, like Porsche or Foxtel millet, Chino and Kaguno, we don't have that data, so I cannot present. But anyway, so one is area, di uh, declining area, other is number of households are growing, a number of households growing these crops are declining. And also, the, if you see the area productivity gains, when try to analyze with some uh, annual compound growth rate, then uh, compared to maize, rice, and wheat, they, have, they are growing, you know, we have a three hectares, actually three, uh, three tons, 3% three growth rate per annum, but other crops, only 1%, very low. Uh, so if you do for any statistics, if you see the statistics, we are importing not only rice, so we have, a, if we say statistics, almost 30, uh, two crores of uh, out of rice are we are importing, but we are also importing uh, 67 crores of uh, you know uh, bucket was imported in 2016, and also so uh, finger millet also imported almost 44 crores. So uh, despite we have a lot of you know cultivation area for this cross, but we are also because we, farmers are uh, not able to cultivate declining area, and we are also importing large, but without any value addition, value chain linkage. This is just import and. Uh, for that. So if you try to see the mapping of value chain, so w when I try to analyze the value chain, so important part is uh, seed system, production, processing, promotion, and consumption. In the seed, uh, because farmers do not have access to diverse quality seeds, because no research systems, no extension providing improved seeds, no private seed company are working there, no agro because there's no incentive in remote area, no research going on. Of course, uh, crop management also is very limited. Processing is very manually, very tedious. Drudgery for women takes almost whole day for a few kilo of things. And so we have a trading, informal trading and exchange is, uh, uh, you know, value chain is very much informal, not connected to, and our consumption system also not connected. Uh, this value chain is not connected to consumption system. And many of these, you know, uh, limited participation of formal research and development actors in the value chains, particularly even private sectors are not in, engaged. And so driving factor for this value chain is production, processing, promotion, and policy, which I can elaborate later. So this is a broader value chain, which I try to map, because these are both horizontal and vertical coordination linkage. We need enabling policy environment, service provisions. So because of time, because I cannot explain, but I will, in the key message, I can explain. So first important part was to, based on this constant, we try to improve the valuation. One is the improvement in the seed and production system, because to improve the availability quality seeds and production system. For that, uh, establishment of community seed banks and operationalization was important. That has been very helpful to promote access, quality seeds, and also multiply source seed for the farmers. And also di running diversity-based farmers, field schools, which focus on biodiversity, not like formerly, not only on uh, management of disease and pest, and building capacity of farmers for participatory plant breeding, grassroots breeding, that is helping to select, because no research scientists are working on these crops, so the far we need to build the capacity of farmers to select and improve their own seeds. <clears throat> So for processing system, we designed some of the uh, electric simplified uh, tracers for, uh, for porcelain millets, chinookutok, and also upscaling of finger millets, and also some of the nutrition analysis, research on nutrition analysis of this crop so that we can promote uh, the varieties cultivars having high nutrient content. <laughs> And so for marketing system, the most important part was linking the farmers group with the local entrepreneurs, uh, bakeries, and uh, also labeling, in, uh, we supported the Humla Delights for labeling packaging of the food menus, and so many, and also exposure visits of farmers, and also uh, promoting homestay groups for marketing of these crops. So for policies, the most important part is policy because, because our formal policy, seed regulatory framework doesn't allow uh, the uh, commercialization of this variety unless they are formally registered or released. So for that, because the release and registration of this farmer's variety is very difficult because there are no guidelines developed, so we're trying to develop guidelines and advocacy and uh, orient the research and action so that there could be easy mechanism to register and release and com commercialize this uh, farmer's variety. So finally, conclusion is, Okay, traditional crops have, you know, uh, they have a global sig significance because of their global contribution for uh, biodiversity. They have a unique gene pools adapted to very risk prone high mountain regions, which could be easily, could be available to other regions also, and have a very good uh, resilience 
uh, genes and climate change adaptations. And there is a potential for market and value chain development. Uh, uh, so we, uh, there is a need to invest on research, education, and extension so that we can promote these crops to address the growing nutritional needs of the urban as well as rural populations. And also, there is a need of incentive because there is the incentive for growing high, high improved, modern exotic varieties, but there is no incentive for traditional varieties and seeds. There, and also, that there is a, we need a both incentive for farmers for growing traditional crops and varieties, and also taxing those, uh, as we already discussed earlier, taxing those junk processed foods imported from outside. That will help, of course. And the most important, we need the targeted needs and needs and needs values and development because these uh, are very niche specific. There is a demand for niche uh, market uh, linking with organic production because they are grown in default organic. If you have organic certification, linking with geographical indication. If you have a unique geographical ori origin, the farmers can benefit from a higher price premium and also consumer could benefit from the nutritious food available, fresh organic nutritious food available for the population so that we can address the, uh, the uh, increasing need of the resilient food system for the current as well as growing population. Thank you very much.